And I think I'm on. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and go into John chapter 2. We're going to be there in just a second. It's a blessing for me to be able to be with you all. Uh, some familiar faces here, some faces I've never seen in my life, and that's okay. Uh, over the, hopefully over the course of the next few days, I'll be able to get to know some of you, some of you a little bit better. Uh, I'll say this kind of just uh, to start off, and, and you'll notice throughout the lessons, I'm awkward in the very beginning of the lessons, and then we kind of get rolling, and we feel like we're doing okay, and then we abruptly end. But... Uh, so Christina and Luke Hurd, who were here for a very long time, uh, have spoken so highly of you guys. And so, though this is my first time worshiping, it's not my first time here, but though it's my first time worshiping with you all, I've heard a lot about you all. I've heard a lot about uh, your dedication to the Lord and the love that you have for him. And they love you and they miss you, uh, at least those of you who were here whenever they were here, those of you who weren't, welcome. Uh, my wife, I'm married. We have two coming on three kids. The reason why she is not here is because she is nine months pregnant. And so... A uh, great deal of thanks to her. I know, Josh, you're baffled that I'm here right now. Uh, but a great deal of thanks to her, and, and she's just, like, awesome. And so it helps with all of that as well. Uh, but, yeah, there's a, a, like, before I started thanking people here and, and the elders and Josh and JP and, and Steve and, and all of that, uh, my wife is awesome, and she's really the real reason all of this is happening right now. But... Uh, but it's good to be with you all and, and to, to spend time in God's word. I'll probably say some more things throughout the week. But John chapter 2, we actually, uh, actually in Zach's class, uh, he was going through the book of Exodus and talking about God manifesting his glory. And at the very end, he actually mentioned John chapter 2. And he's like, that's one of those miracles that Jesus does that it's like, it's like one of the mundane miracles, which I don't know where you are, Zach, right now. Well, there you are. It can't be a miracle and mundane. Those things contradict. But, uh, but, it, no, but, but, but he says something that I think is actually interesting because the miracle we're going to study this morning in John chapter 2 is one of the ones that I think almost doesn't really work with the other ones. It doesn't make sense. Um, but it's there in John 2, and it's there for a reason. Uh, before we get into the miracles, I actually want to begin in John chapter 20. Because in John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31, and if you kind of look in the brackets, I also kind of imposed John 21 verse 25. But in John 20, as John is wrapping up his letter, he says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Which, if they were written in detail, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. But these have been written. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in his name, you may have life. So I want you to think about this for a second. I mean, just think about what John is saying as he's wrapping up his letter. John is saying, listen, if I really try to write down everything that Jesus did, I mean, and even try to either write it down in detail or just write down the stuff that he did, we wouldn't have the books. We wouldn't have the scrolls to write everything down. That's kind of the idea he's saying. But then he's going to say, but these seven that I write in this book are written with a purpose. That these seven are here because they're trying to help you understand that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that as you study these miracles, that there's lessons to be learned about him. There's lessons to be learned about you, about how we relate to him, and, and really that in God we find the longings that we've been all looking for. And so, uh, before we get into the miracles, again, like, it's no surprise that Jesus does and did miracles. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, in Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, that's what he says. That whenever he talks about Jesus, he says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, he wasn't just some regular guy. You know that. You were there. Though you put him to death, you know that he wasn't like the rest of us. Because he was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst that you yourselves know. No one is denying this. And now the New Testament will use different words to talk about the works. And maybe the way that the Gospel of John will mention Jesus' miracles, it gets called the works. So they'll use three different words to talk about the works of Jesus. Sometimes the word is miracles, sometimes they're wonders, sometimes they're signs. It's all talking about the same event, but describing different things. So I want to kind of just show it to you very quickly, if you don't, if you don't mind, which you kind of don't have an option. But uh, when we talk about something being miraculous, you know what that means, right? When something is miraculous, I mean, like, it's, it's supernatural. And so here's sometimes the problem, right? It's like we, someone's in a, in a car wreck. And they had a 1% chance of living. And you're like, it's a miracle. It's not a miracle. They had a 1% chance. 
statistically improbable, but not miraculous. Everything that Jesus does when it gets talked about a miracle, it is to test like, like statistically impossible. It was never going to happen any otherwise. You get what I'm saying? You, that makes sense, right? So think about this. So Lazarus dies, John chapter 11. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. How many people have died and been risen from the dead four days later? Statistically impossible. Jesus will be around 5,000 men and women and children, and he'll have five pieces of bread and two fish. And he feeds everybody, and not just feeds everybody, but feeds everyone. Everyone is full, and there's baskets left. Statistically impossible. You see what I'm saying? So when the Bible talks about this is a miracle, we're not talking about things that, uh, you know, you can kind of sort of maybe have fabricated it. These are things that would have, wouldn't have happened otherwise. So that's, they always happen immediately. It never takes a little bit of time. When Jesus heals the blind man in John 9, it's not like he healed him and was like, all right, in six months, come back for your second visit, and then we'll give you some glasses, and then we'll do LASIK, and then after that, you'll have your sight. That's not the way that it works. When he heals the man, it's immediately he recovers his sight. And so you kind of see that. And so when we talk about, again, miracles, miracles are always something that are supernatural. When, the, when, when you look at these words and it talks about the word a wonder, like these wonders, it, it, it always shocked people. Everyone that was there, they were left marveling. Sometimes the, the, your text might say they marveled at what he did, that it caught people's attention. And then that these are signs that it's pointing us to something. And so there, there are different elements of the same work. I'll show you this very, very quickly in Mark chapter two. In Mark chapter two, uh, Mark chapter two, verses eight through 11 is whenever Jesus heals the paralytic. And you know, you know the story. He's in the, hopefully you know the story. If you don't, don't read Mark 2 right now, but read it later on. But in Mark 2, uh, there's, these four, there's this guy, he's paralyzed, and these four friends come and bring him to Jesus. They think, this is the way our friend's going to get healed. And they get to the door, and what they realize is, we can't get in, because the house is full. And he's been teaching people. So what they do is they open up the ladder, so they open up the, 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 the roof of the house, and they let him down. And Jesus sees them, and he says, he sees son, seeing their faith, the text says, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees that are there, they start reasoning within their hearts. And they says, who can, well, who can forgive sins but God alone? And so in the text, it says, Jesus immediately, or sorry, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning this in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or get up, pick up your pallet and walk. But notice here, verse 10, this is the sign. But so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So this is what he's trying to help them understand. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up your pallet, or pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up immediately, he picked up his pallet and went out of the sight of everyone. That's the miracle. There was a man who was paralyzed, couldn't walk. Four friends had to bring him down. And now immediately he gets up. He's able to take his bed and walk home. So you see the miracle aspect in that. And note, then notice the sign. And so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. And that's the wonder. You, you kind of see the way that works there? And so you'll see this in every miracle that Jesus does. There's some element of all three of these. Uh, but tonight, uh, tonight, this morning, we're actually going to look at the very first one. The miracle of Jesus turning water to wine. And it's found in John chapter 2. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the lesson kind of in, in three parts. So we're going to set the scene and try to understand the story. So what's going on in the story? Uh, I mean, I'm giving you the, the kind of the answer, what the, what the sign is with the second box there. But it's, this is a, a miracle of transformation. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time acknowledging our need for transformation. And not just our need, but really our desire for transformation. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about how transformation is found and only, truly only found in Jesus. And so, uh, John chapter 2, we have already, I'm trying to make sure. Can y'all see that? Fine. Give me a head nod if you can. Okay, good. Uh, John chapter 2. So we, we already read the scripture. But it says, y'all read it in the ESV, which is okay. Uh, this is going to be the New American Standard 95. All the text I'm going to be using is the New American Standard 95. If you use the ESV, I'm not knocking you. But just a heads up, uh, it might read just a little bit different. But John 2, start, that was also for levity's sake, but that's okay. Uh, it says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And so again, in John chapter two, as you set up the scene, the scene really is just Jesus and his disciples are at a wedding. And it seems like at least Mary is the person that's known at the wedding. And he's kind of just invited. Weddings then are not like weddings now. Weddings now, you kind of invite like your closest friends and your family. And that's kind of it. Weddings in the first century, especially Jewish weddings, were a much more community event. And they didn't happen over the course of a day. It was kind of like it happened over the course of a few days. And so it's just, you know, Jesus and his disciples, they're just at a wedding and they run out of wine while they're there. And, and, and but to, to really understand the miracle, uh, 
or what's going on here, because there's some things that happen in John chapter 2 uh, that I think just for the sake of, of understanding it a little bit better, I want to pose just quick math problem. And I promise you this is very basic math. You can all definitely do this. All right, so find the area of the circle below. If, 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 the, if the circle's radius is 1, what would the area be? You can lip it to me. I know you don't want to speak. I need someone to lip it. Pi, correct. Thank you, someone who said that. It's pi. Because the area of a circle is just pi r squared. And so if the radius is 1, radius 1 squared times pi is pi. But how do you know what pi is? You're going to tell me it's 3.142857? Yeah, I get that. But how do you know that's what that number is? I promise this is all going to get to something here in just a second. There was this mathematician named Archimedes. Uh, and Archimedes had this method of exhaustion. Now, there's different guys that found pi in different ways. But he had this method of exhaustion, and you might think this is exhausting right now, but what he, what he, what he said is he'd take a polygon, and he'd say if we can inscribe and then circumscribe polygons to which we do know the area, what you know for a fact is that the area in the circle has to fit between those two bounds. I'm just going to explain it super quickly, very basically, and I promise we'll get back to John 2 in a way that hopefully makes sense. So, what he did is, he inscribed the square, and then he circumscribed the square. And again, so you kind of get the picture. If I know the area of the square on the inside, and know the area of the square on the outside, I know that the circle has to fall between those two, between, the area of the circle has to fall between those two squares. That makes sense, right? So if the area of the inscribed square is 2, and the area of the circumscribed square is 4, then you know for a fact that the area of the circle has to fall between 2 and 4. Are you still with me? All right, this is perfect. So then what he did is he said, all right, let's cut some sides out. So you go from four sides to eight sides. So you make it into an octagon, which if you kind of squint your eyes, you start to see it starts to look a little bit more like a circle. And so the area of the inscribed octagon is 2.83. The area of the circumscribed octagon is 3.31. And so you know again that the area of the circle, whose radius is pi, has to fall between those bounds. You keep cutting off sides, and it gets closer and closer and closer to a circle. And that's how kind of like... Old mathematicians, that's kind of how they got to that number pi. Are you still with me? All right, great. So what does that mean for us? And why does that matter? Well, in John chapter 2, you get some things of Jesus, I think, things that Jesus says that seem a little strange. So, for example, he'll tell his mother, woman, what does this have to do with me? And if my mom, if I ever said that to my mom, it would have been a very different situation. You know what I mean? And then in the story, he goes and he turns water to wine which a lot of people use this chapter and use the text to teach a lot of things that I don't believe to be true, but also to teach a lot of things that the text isn't even talking about. Again, Archimedes' method of exhaustion. The bounds, like the, the, the area has to fit between the bounds of, of what he's already talked about. In John chapter 1, think about some of the things, some of the ways in which Jesus is described in John 1. In John 1, he is described as God himself. From the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God. That he's, he's, he comes and he's the light. He's not just God, but he's also the light to come to people in darkness. That whenever John the Baptist sees him, John says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That's how he's described in John chapter 1. In John chapter 3, whether it's John or it's Jesus, G, well, Jesus himself will say that he's the one who's come, that's, that, that's come to be lifted up to draw all peoples to himself. And then a little bit later on in John 3, 16, he's the beloved Son of God that's come to save all men so that none would perish. Again, John chapter 2 might be a little bit confusing and a little bit weird, but keep it within the context. I'm saying all of this to make a point, a contextual point, that who Jesus is in John 2 has to follow who he is in John 1 and who he'll be in John chapter 3. And so whatever you think is going on as far as what the wine is or what the wine isn't, in John 1, he's the son of God who came to bring life to manifest God to you. In John 3, he's the son of God who came to give his life that none would perish. Whatever's happening in John chapter 2 has to fit those bounds. You get what I'm saying? So all of that was just a big point so we can talk about math and talk about context matters in the text. Uh, so going back to John chapter 2, what Jesus will say, again, so she, she, the mother of Jesus says they have no wine, and he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Really interesting thing. This is, we still really haven't even gotten to the sign. This is just setting up the scene. I think whenever you look at Jesus' interactions with Mary, at the, in the Gospel of John at least, in the beginning and at the end, there's two interactions that he has with her. And both times, you'll see Jesus honor his mother, but he will never do it at the expense of the Father's will. And I wonder, again, not really getting to the miracle, but I think there's a lesson there for us. There's a lesson for us in, in being able to honor our parents, honor our family, 
But make sure that it doesn't interfl- like interject or, or get in the way of, of us really serving God the way that we're supposed to. So in John 2, he'll do the miracle, but he, he'll say, my hour has not yet come. So you notice it's not a, a like, huge public miracle like the other ones. And then in John 19 on the cross, which is whenever he's talking to her and talking to John, and he's dying. He's doing the Father's will, but at the same time, he's honoring his mother. And so I think you look at Jesus and you get perfectly the Son of Man, Son of God kind of images, even in his interactions with Mary. Uh, but as, as the story continues, again, verse 5, he'll say to this, so his mother will say to his servants, I don't know if he says something, if he makes a face, or if she just knows he's going to do something. But in verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone, pot, six stone water pots set there for Jewish customs of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the, wa- fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, draw some out and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. And so again, you see the miracle and you see the one so you see the miracle and you see the that should have been in, in should have been in like the pink. Uh, you see the miracle and you see the uh, the wonder. The wine is miraculously turned, the water is miraculously turned to wine. So here's my question for you. Like, how do you know that's a miracle? Because I can turn water to wine. I can turn water to grape juice. I can turn water. I can, you give me a little bit of water. You leave me and I have a little bit of Kool-Aid power, powder. I can turn water into anything else. You know what I mean? How do you know this is miraculous? What makes this miraculous in the text? Because remember, we said miracles are something that happen and they're completely supernatural. So they wouldn't have happened otherwise. Like you, you, you run the case 100 and 100 out of 100 times, it would stay the same. So what makes this different? How do you know this is miraculous? Uh, and, and again, you see that the head waiter is shocked by how good it is. Well, I think whenever you think about what makes this miraculous, Jesus never touches the water. And you see that, right? He, she says whatever he tells you to do it. And he tells them, go and fill the water pots. Which, by the way, if something is filled up to the brim like they do it, can you add anything to it without spilling it over? The answer is no. There's no way that you can. Because if you add anything to it, it's going to spill. And then you can say, okay, well, he obviously did something to contaminate or to enhance the water. And that's why it became this. He never touches the water himself. And just another little kind of thread or just rock in the shoe here for you to think about. Every miracle that Jesus performs in the Gospel of John involves man's obedience. He requires people. He uses people. To, to accomplish the end that he's trying to accomplish. Every miracle. He feeds the 5,000. He uses the servants. Even, in fact, the centurion in, in, in John 4, he has to have some faith, and he has to obey, and he has to leave. In Mark 2, he has to pick up and pallet his pallet and walk. Every miracle that Jesus performs, there is some, some working that he has with, with mankind. I think that's just, well, we'll get to the point with that here in just a second. But then the text reads, it says, Again, the man says, the head waiter says, you drink the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. You have kept the good wine until now. And then he says, this beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed him. So again, that's great. He does a mundane thing. He turns water to wine. Who cares? What does this mean? I'm just making fun of you now, Zach, by the way. I just want you to know that. I really appreciated your class. But what does this mean? What lessons are there for us here? Let me tell you, this miracle, at least personally, uh, has been the most impactful in my life. Uh, Because though these are just breadcrumbs, maybe Mark chapter 8, now I'm just going back to you, Zach. Though these are like Mark chapter 8, when the Syrophoenician lady goes to Jesus, and she says, yeah, but even the dogs eat the breadcrumbs. And the breadcrumbs that Jesus offers her is more than enough. And I think this is going to be true in this miracle. Hopefully you'll see this as well. But I think there's some lessons for us to consider. Maybe the first one, the easiest one to consider is consider just, y'all are studying the book of Exodus here in the auditorium. Consider all the connections with the book of Exodus, with Moses, with the Torah. I don't think it's by mistake that the first sign that he does is water to wine. Because the first plague, remember the book of, in the book of Exodus, y'all, you're here in the auditorium studying it. The book of Exodus, God is trying to demonstrate that he is the I am. You think about all these themes. He's trying to demonstrate that he is the I am. I actually think that the overarching theme of the book of Exodus is that God wants to dwell with his people, which is what Zach was getting to at the end of his class. God wants to be with his people. He's trying to show you that he's, I, he's the I am. And whenever someone questions that, the very first thing he does, that, Pharaoh, that God shows Pharaoh, when Pharaoh says, who is the Lord in Exodus chapter 5, that I should obey the Lord? Moreover, I don't know who he is. I'm not freeing the people. You know what Moses does? He goes to the Nile River, and the Nile goes from water to blood. 
And I think you have these bookends of water to blood, death of, the, death of the firstborn in the book of Exodus. And in the gospel of John, you'll have water to wine. And then you'll have the death of the firstborn of Jesus and then his subsequent resurrection. So I think you're supposed to see all those elements. In fact, if you like see Exodus and John side by side, there's a lot of themes that, that overlap and that I think are supposed to be appreciated. But this miracle is a miracle of transformation. That's really the point of the miracle. That God is a God of transformation. That God transforms and God wants to transform you. In fact, this isn't even the first time you get this element in the Gospel of John. The book begins with a transformation. It begins in John chapter 1 by saying, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then in chapter 14, the Word became flesh. It went from being, he went from being God to becoming a man. There was a transformation that Jesus himself went through. Whenever Jesus meets Peter... He sees, or really his brother finds Peter, uh, Andrew finds Peter, and he says, he finds Sim, Simon, which was his name. He says, we have found the Messiah. And then in John, John 1, 42, he brings him to Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And I think there's like, in, in John 1, as, John is, as Jesus is interacting with Peter, there's a shadow of what's going to happen to Peter. And you kind of, you go through the Gospels, and you see all the, all the apostles transform, and all of them cha change. You look at the Apostle of Tarsus, and you look at his transformation, that the God that we serve, that the God of the Bible, that in the Gospel of John, in his miracles, the first thing he wants you to know is that he's a God that can transform you. And that we all need transformation. That the God that you serve is a God of transformation. Think about this for a second. Everybody needs to be transformed. The problem is, is that some people think they've already done it. In John chapter 3, Jesus is interacting with Nicodemus. And as he interacts with Nicodemus, he, Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Nicodemus is like, good teacher, we know that you've come from God because no one can do the signs that you're doing unless God is with him. You know what Jesus says to him immediately? Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus is confused because if I'm Nicodemus, I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I'm already part of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, do not be amazed that I say to you, you, this makes it personal for Nicodemus, you must be born again. That everybody needs transformation, and sometimes our problem is, is we think we've already made it. We think I'm done transforming. We think I've obtained whatever it is, whatever measure or standard I was trying to obtain. I've gotten there. Some people don't even know that they have a need. In John 4, so like you look at, so John 2 is the miracle. The next four chapters, you, these ideas are going to come from. But in John 4, he'll talk to the woman at the well. And you know the conversation, right? So he's talking to her, and he tells her, like, he asks for a drink of water. She's confused about the whole thing. And then he says, go call your husband. And she says, sir, I don't have a husband. And he's like, you're right. For you've had five, and the one you're with now is not your husband. This you have said truly. I don't think Jesus is being mean. I don't think he's trying to call out her past to call out her past. I think he's trying to show her, hey, you actually have a deep thirst inside of you. Now, there's a well that's completely empty that you wish there were water in. And you keep looking in different places, thinking this is going to fill you up, thinking this is going to fill you up. None of it's doing it. But let me show you, by the way, that the fact that you're living your life this way actually points to a desire that you have deep down inside. In John chapter 5, you have the man at the pool in Bethesda, the lame man. And Jesus asks him, do you want to be made well? And in John chapter 5 and verse 7, the man will say, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But, wh but while I am coming, another steps down before me. There are some people who realize they have a need who see things, and maybe that's you, like you see things in your life that you're like, this has got to change. I can't keep living like this. I can't keep being this person. I can't keep struggling with these things. But sometimes we just feel hopeless to a solution. That you feel like I've tried everything, and every time I try to, everything I think, I'm getting close, I'm getting to the solution, someone beats me to it. And then in John chapter 6, I think some people realize that they have a desire, but they look to fill it in the wrong way. In John 6, you have Jesus feeding the 5,000. And you remember what they do the very next day after he feeds them? They look for him again, but not because they care about him, but because they want bread. And Jesus says to them in John 6, 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. We all need to be transformed. Here's the thing. You have to realize is that anyone, any transformation outside of Jesus won't last. It doesn't matter what self-help book you read, what philosophy book you read. It doesn't matter how, how much better you get your body or how much better you get your mind or whatever it is. None of that matters. Any transformation that you make outside of Jesus of Nazareth will not last. It won't be permanent. 
that whenever you read the Bible and you discover Jesus of Nazareth, what he does is he exposes your need to change. And when you read the Bible, that's what it does to you. It shows you, think about, it shows you the perfection of God. And it shows you that you're not there. And then you see God's grace in helping you attain that. That Jesus is uniquely equipped to transform you. And that we shouldn't shortchange the gift, that, the gift that God is offering us for something else. And so again, God is a God of transformation. And you need to be transformed altogether. Like, God isn't looking to make a better you. You know that, right? It's not like, all right, God, I'm coming to you and I'm like 90% finished. If you can do the last 10%, that'd be great. That's not what he tells Nicodemus. Born again is all of it. Let's get rid of it. Let's start all over again. Is that if you're coming to God, one of the things you need to realize is that God isn't going to make you the best you. He's not trying to transform you into the best version of yourself. You need to be remade altogether into someone you were not before. And in Ephesians 4, Paul says, starting in verse 25, laying aside, because this is why, he says, laying aside falsehood, speak the truth each of you to his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer. But rather, he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no one wholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such, wor such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. That all of you needs to be put away. God does, again... We need to be transformed all together. But did you notice in the text how the transformation happens? By the way, could Jesus have magically just, or miraculously, that's magic, you know, whatever. Could Jesus have just miraculously put the water in the water pots? Can I get a yes or a no? Can, he's God. He does whatever he wants to do. Absolutely he could. In fact, could Jesus have just spoken and the, wor and the water in the water pots already have been, and the water would it just have been wine? Absolutely. He's God. He does whatever he wants to do. So why make them fill the water pots up? You ever thought about that? Why make the disciples sit down and go and feed everyone? If Jesus wanted to, he could have spoken and everyone had bread in their, like in their, in their laps. Why make them do this? Again, I think this, there's a lesson for us, and there's a lesson for them, that transformation happens through obedience. Back in the text, she'll say, Mary will say to Jesus, whatever he says to you, do it. And he says to them, and so they do it, and they fill it up to the brim. And then he says, draw out some now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. That the water was transformed when the servants listened to the words of Jesus. And listen doesn't just mean like they heard it. They listened and obeyed. That oftentimes we want to be transformed, we want to be different. And we say, well, I've been going to church for years. I've been doing this thing for years, and I'm still the same person. You know why? Because it's like, it's like, imagine if I told you I go to the gym every day of the week. What would you think of me? I'm not going to try to flex my arms. There's nothing there. But what would you think of me? Imagine you hadn't seen me. Like, I, you'd be like, man, that dude is yoked. Like, all right, get on him. All I told you is I go to the gym every day of the week. You get what I'm saying? There's people who go to the gym and you know what they do? Like, that's, <laughs> that's what they do for an hour. And they leave the gym the same person that they went into the gym. Do we do that here sometimes, though? Where we come here and we do, hey. How are you? How are you? I'm fine. I'm doing great. Terribly inside, by the way. I'm doing great. It's good to see you. I'm going to sing out. This is my favorite hymn. I'm going to really sing right now. And then you leave the same person you came in. You were never going to change. And then you wonder after 10 years, after 15 years, well, this God stuff, this doesn't actually work. This, this word of God stuff, it does nothing because I grew up in the pews. And look, I'm still the same person. Yeah, because you never actually applied anything. You want to be transformed. God has the power to transform you, but you've got to listen to what he's telling you to do. It's not just going to magically happen because he just said it's going to happen. Like you, they had to obey. They had to do what he was calling them to do. And let me tell you, the transformation, at least here, is arduous and it takes, it's time consuming. Again, like if I told you today to fill a water pot with water, my guess is the sens sensible people, you're going to go and get a water hose and connect it to your holes, and then go. And it'll take a little bit of time, but that's how you're doing it. Did they have that luxury back then? So for them to fill water pots, we're talking, I mean, they would have had to probably, assuming, get buckets, fill it up, go fill it, like, it would have taken time. Could you imagine, by the way, so that it says they filled six stone water pots, 
and each of them held 20 to 30 gallons. So we're talking, I mean, 120 to 180 gallons of, of water. Think about how much time that would take. Could you imagine after 50 gallons, you're one of the servants? Like, this is an absolute waste of time. I'm exhausted and nothing's happening. Could you imagine after 80 gallons, after 100 gallons, you're like, this is, this is crazy. This isn't making any sense. I mean, we're, we're slaving ourselves out here for nothing, it seems like. What would have happened if they would have stopped? Transformation is hard. Transformation takes time. God can transform you. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever sin, whatever, like, doubt, God has the ability to change you. But you've got to realize that change doesn't happen overnight. God's got the power to change you, but you, you're going to have to put some work in, and it's going to take time. And I think sometimes we just, we just live in a culture where everything is immediate. I'm starting to sound like curmudgeon now, but like where everything is immediate, everything is fast. If you don't get it fast, you don't want it anymore. You know? If you've got to watch a video and it takes like a few seconds to buffer, ah, whatever, I'll just reload. Re like that's, that's how we live our lives. Well, you don't have to do any work ever. Let me tell you something, you, if the real work that lasts, that you, that you want deep down inside, is going to require work. No one, there's no shortcuts to the transformation that God offers you. It takes time, and it takes effort, and it's hard, and there's blood, and there's sweat, and there's tears, and, and you know, there's times where you fall, but, like, but transformation can happen. And again, the transformation comes through obedience of God's word. That's, we already read the text here in Ephesians 4, but he says, stop doing this, and instead... Just believe in God in your heart, and you'll be different. That's not what he says. He'll say, stop doing this and start doing something else. So start speaking the truth. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Stop being bitter and wrathful. Only, like, only speak words that are going to edify people. Put away all bitterness and forgive one another, going into chapter 5. And that whenever God, whenever you allow yourself to be transformed by God through obeying his word, God transforms you into something completely undeniable. Did you notice that in the text, by the way? That whenever they, the, head, the head waiter drinks, he says, this is the, you saved the best for last. You have kept the good wine until now. They understand that whatever they're drinking is unlike, he's like, this is unlike anything we've had all day. That whenever we allow God to transform us, again, through his word, through obeying his word, you become someone that's completely undeniable. The person you become, the way in which you live your life, the peace, the joy that you have is undeniable. That people see it and they acknowledge it. They're like, wait, something's actually different about you. Something's really, because I respond to things. I have things. We all, everybody goes through storms. You're not unique in that. Everybody goes through hard times. That's real for everybody. If you're a human being, that's just life. Everybody goes through loss. Everybody goes through pain. Every, like that's, that's a fact that humans go through. Why do you respond different? Why do you have self-control when someone cuts you off like that? Man, you didn't get this thing that you wanted. Why are you just not? I'd, I'd have been helpless and in despair. Why are you responding different? Because again, whenever you're in God and God transforms you, you become something completely undeniable. The head waiter knew that this was the best wine that he had had. And again, in the transformed wine, notice, it led to a belief in his disciples. I wonder if there's a lesson there for us. That whenever you allow yourself again to be transformed by God, you ever thought about the impact that you have on other people here who are also trying to be transformed? Who are maybe 10 water, I mean, 10 gallons in and wondering if this is actually going to work? That are maybe 50 gallons in and wondering, this is, this, is this change really going to happen? Because I'm trying to do what the scriptures told me to do. I'm trying to read, I'm trying to pray, I'm trying to apply all these things. And I just, is it really going to work? Can people see you and say there's wine that used to be water that's been transformed by God's word? Is there something about your life that's leading to faith, not just for people in the world, but leading to faith to people even within this building who are a little behind where you currently are right now? That God isn't trying to make you into the best you because he's trying to make you into himself. You know that, right? That he's not trying to transform you. Again, God doesn't want the best bill. The best bill is still meh. That's true of all of you. The best you isn't good enough. That's like a... I don't know if you grew up being told you were special. You're not that special. But God is. And God allows you to become, to be remade in his image. Like, that's the beauty of the gospel. That God is trying to transform you into himself. In Ephesians 4, Paul says, I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. That's how you used to live. The way that you used to live, you were like a Gentile. 
that you were alienated, your mind was darkened, that you were callous in every way. But then he says in verse 20, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. And then you'll say, God wants to renew you. Put on the new self. But this new self isn't made in your likeness, and it isn't made in the likeness of anybody else in this building. This new self is made in the likeness of God, created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. That God has the power to transform you. And God is the model in what you're being transformed into. It's just the fact of the matter. We've, we've read these two texts. We won't reread it again. But again, if you notice in, in Ephesians 4, he'll say that you do not learn Christ, have heard him. Truth is in Jesus. God is making you into the likeness of God. That's the standard for all of us. That's why God's word matters so much. It's not just that God is trying to save you. Whenever he says the, the truth is in Jesus, I do not believe that Paul is saying that the truth of salvation and life is in Jesus. That's true. I don't think that's the point he's making, though. When he says truth is in Jesus, the truth of what life has always been about, the purpose for living is found in the person of Jesus, in the life that he lived. That's the image. That's the goal. That's the standard. Amen. That everything that you see Jesus do in the Gospels, sans miracles that you cannot do, you're supposed to try to emulate in some way. So, for example, John chapter 13, he washes the disciples' feet. Everything. Truth is in Jesus. What lessons am I supposed to learn? You know what? First of all, maybe I learned the lesson that when I have an expectation that my home is with God in heaven, I can do anything. And I can serve and, and subject myself to anything. Because that's what happens. That's what he does. It says he, knowing that he came from the Father and he was going back to the Father, he got down and washed feet. Sometimes we're arrogant because we think this is our life and we think these are our little kingdoms. That in John chapter 13, he washes feet of the same people that were going to abandon him that night. Is there a lesson for us there in service and obedience and, and serving people that might still hurt you? Again, you, you read every text and then you read the stories of Jesus and he shows you how to live life. And the last idea here. Again, the, the, the water to wine is a miracle of transformation. That God is a God of transformation. That God transforms you through obedience. He transforms you into something that's completely undeniable because he's transforming you into himself. But you know where God's glory was first demonstrated? In fact, to keep the, the Exodus idea. You see God's glory in the wilderness with a bunch of ex-slaves. That's where you see it in Exodus. That you see God's glory in Cana of Galilee. That's a no place. Like, that's a nobody. That's a no place place. It's not in Rome. It's not in Greece. It's not in Athens. It's in a wedding in Cana of Galilee. That the Gospel of John has this drumbeat of the glory of God that was going to ultimately be shown on a cross. That God manifests his glory in the lowest of places. And in the lowest of situations, that God has the ability to transform. And maybe you're sitting here thinking to yourself, yeah, but not me. Because you don't know how low I am right now. Not me, because though I come here and I smile and I look like everything is fine deep down inside, I am just in a pit. That God's glory is especially made known in these places. So regardless of where you are, Regardless of where you are with the Lord, regardless of where you are in your own walk, you need to understand that God has the ability to change you. Even if you're doing well in the Lord, God wants you to continue to change and to continue to be remade in his image. But again, that only happens through obedience. And so if there's someone here this morning who has not obeyed Jesus Christ, that transformation begins by putting him on by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, by, being, by putting, putting, all, putting off the old man and putting on the new man that's remade in Jesus' image. Maybe you're here and you know that you haven't been living right and you know you need a change. Again, I don't worship here, but I know a lot of really good people here who love people and love souls because they especially love the Lord and want nothing more than to help you. If they can or we can help you in any way, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.